We are reconvening from our executive session, um, and this is the regular meeting of the school committee uh, for November 14, 2019. I request all of you uh, who are willing to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. great to see so many people out here tonight. It's not very common for us. Um, it's time for public comment. Is there anyone here to make a comment? Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hello, Mr. Herr. Nice to see you all. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Brian Herr. I'm a member of the Board of Selectmen. I am here speaking tonight as one member of the Board of Selectmen. And I just want to stop by, uh, say hello. Welcome to budget season and uh, talk a little bit about that process. Uh, we've gotten a few emails so far about the budget process and the budget message. Um, we're a little early yet in some of the concern, I think, frankly. Um, the budget process probably doesn't get wrapped up in Hopkinton typically until maybe March 15th, March 31st, somewhere around there. Uh, and it's a very, as you folks know, it's a very back and forth process. It takes a while, not only with the schools, but with all the departments uh, in town. And um, I know that the budget, the budget message that we put out, uh, that you folks attended about a month or so back, probably was a little confusing to some, and certainly to those that might not have followed the budget process as closely in years past. Um, but uh, when we said that we would not name a number, uh, with all, you know, frankly, that was a good thing for the Hopkinton Public School System. Because if we did name a number in the budget message by department, that would have started to nail, sort of draw the lines in the sand a little bit. And we do not want to draw the lines in the sand at this stage of the game. So if there's folks that are concerned that there were numbers thrown out and I said, no, we're not voting a number, um, that was intentional to keep it very flexible and open so we could truly get a feel for what's going on in schools and what we do need and then how we figure out how we can fund that. So uh, I just wanted to sort of let everybody know that the budget process is a very long, deliberative, and at times painful for those of us in the middle of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, we work it out. And I think over the last, you know, I've been involved for 20 years now, the last 20 years that I've been involved anyway, and others have been involved for that long, uh, we've got it figured out and the schools get uh, funded strongly. And that will not change this year, uh, despite all the challenges we have with growth. Uh, the schools are doing a great job. Uh, the administration is doing a great job. The teachers are doing a great stop job. The students are doing a great job. We have great schools in Hopkinton, and we're going to keep it that way. So just bear with us. Don't panic, and don't read everything, and don't believe everything you read online or in a newspaper. Trust me on that one. Um, secondly, I just wanted to talk real quick about uh, my favorite project right now. I bring my plans with me everywhere in case anyone has questions. Um, is the corridor project, and some dialogue that's going on in town that, well, if we don't build the project, if we don't spend the $3 million on the road project, we'll just take that $3 million and give it to the schools. Now, you folks know probably that's not how it works. State law would never allow that because town meeting said, here's $3 million bucks to build the roads. Town meeting did not say, here's $3 million bucks, go spend it as you see fit, and if you don't have a good use for it, give it to the schools. It just doesn't work that way. So if the project does not go forward for whatever reason, I personally think it should, as do many others, uh, but if it doesn't go forward for some reason, the $3 million that's on the table right now that we're on the hook for will likely go to about $4.5 million because we still have to do all the work on Main Street that we have chose not to do over the last 15 years because we've been walking down this path. So I just wanted to make it clear that for those that think we can move money around from one bucket to another, that is not possible. It's not because we don't want to help the schools. It's because state law would not allow it. And as much as I love the job, I'm not going to jail over it. So uh, we need to sort of hang in there with that situation as well. We have a special town meeting in December, and we'll sort all that out. But I just don't want there to be any confusion about a $3 million windfall if this project does not go forward. That would not happen. Uh, finally. I'm at it a long time. The schools are the best thing we got going in Hopkinton by far. 
when it comes to how we drive our community and how we drive our economics uh, for the community. And I'll always be there with the schools, and I know my colleagues will be there, so we'll figure this out this year. So just please hang in there with us. Okay? Thank you so much, Mr. Herr, for your kind encouragement, great words, and your unwavering support for the schools. Thank you. Does anyone else want to say anything? Nancy has something to it, say. Just quickly, I, I just want to be clear that I had not heard anything about the money being moved from one bucket to another, and certainly I, I can speak only for myself because we haven't discussed it here, but I was certainly aware that that would never happen. Right. Regardless in, of what happens with the downtown project. Uh, and also have enjoyed in years past your presence in the budget presentation. In I look forward to them. It's very exciting stuff. I appreciate the support. So. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ha. Moving on uh, to recognition, we wanted to take a moment. Sure. I just wanted to take a moment. Um, if we could just have a, a moment to recognize uh, Dr. Kathy McLeod, uh, who passed away a couple of weekends ago. As you know, she was our superintendent for five years, and she carried out the role with grace, with dignity, with care for children, with intellect. I mean, there was something beautiful about her in in all in all ways. And so, if we could just take a, a moment to. Um, be silent and reflect on Kathy's uh, contributions to the community. Thank you. Um, for those of you who have um, some interest, uh, there was an obituary that was in the Boston Globe, if you wanted to take a look at it. Um, but again, Kathy was just such a gift to us, so thanks. Does anyone else want to say anything? There is a lovely article in The Independent that came out today as well. Very nice. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda are reports. We are looking for our school council. Are they here tonight? Perhaps not. Uh, moving on to the next item. Mr. Arthur, make the quarterly financial report. Yes. Um, so what you have in your packet is the financial report for through the month of November, or through uh, November 5th, actually. You can see from the cover page that currently we are running a positive variance of, of 55957 You can see the payroll um, accounts that are in a deficit and the expense accounts that are in a positive um, variance. Um, the big thing to point out with the, uh, the expense accounts, the positive variance right now is running with our out-of-district tuitions. Um, which is really a reflection on the great work by Dr. Zaleski in, in working with families and finding the most appropriate um, place for students. Um, so you can see right now, even with the um, positions that have been added after the budget process, at this current time, we're still running a positive variance. You go to the next page, you can see just as a refresher of the positions that have been added so far to date. Uh, if you go to the fourth page, I know there's been some interest in discussing where we are with our capital projects. So just a quick rundown. Um, the, these are the projects that are ongoing or that are for this fiscal year. The turf fields, the turf fields have been completed with the exception of administrative uh, issues, and that's really closing out the uh, wetlands order of conditions. And that is the wetland order of conditions that has been attached from the time the school was built that has now been attached to the turf fields. And that is the capital article that we have open right now for the 40,000 that is not sufficient funding to actually do that replication. So you'll see that second piece of funding request for FY21. So for all intents and purposes, the turf fields are complete with that exception. Um, the bus parking lot is also complete. We're in that closeout. We'll, we'll be getting our as-built applying for closing out um, 
those order of conditions as well. The technology upgrades. So at this point in time, this is complete. There have been three new data, ser data center servers installed in over 150 wireless access points at both the high school and Hopkins. Uh, the capital replacements district-wide, most of this has been focused at eight on HVAC uh, work. So currently there has been uh, two new fan motors for a large unit for Hopkins, basically rebuilding a unit that services um, the common areas, the hallways. And there are several exhaust fans that will be replaced for Hopkins, the high school, and the middle school. The security upgrades, there have been 30 cameras each installed at both Hopkins and Elmwood, internal cameras. And also there is a new fiber run that will be going down to the turf field and the loop road. And that um, installation and work is still ongoing. That will allow for security around the turf field and, and the, the loop road. The kitchen equipment, that is mostly complete. That was in addition to using the kitchen revolving, we installed a lot of new equipment uh, this year to replace the equipment that basically has been there since the kitchens and the, the schools have been opened. Um, so there was a lot of new equipment that uh, brought those kitchens up to grade. The wetland order of conditions, again, that one is at a standstill because we need the full 100,000 for that rep wetland replication, which is attached to the turf fields. Roof engineering, this is ongoing. We've been working with the engineer. Um, they've done their test cuts, and um, we're at the point now where that should go out to bid in December, January, and that should give us a firm number for town meeting in May of exactly what that cost will be. Uh, the capacity capacity study, you will hear more uh, with Dr. Kavanaugh's report. That also is in its final stages. We'll be getting the final report of the results of that at the end of November. The boiler replacement, we are still in the process of getting quotes from our engineers to do the design engineering for the the middle, this is the middle school boiler. So that one is in the process. And the special education van has been purchased. You'll see now there's two vans out there, the, the handicap van and the other van. And both vans are in full use um, during the day, almost every day. So that gives you a brief summary of where we are in terms of the fiscal 20. If there's any questions? Thank you. Great. Um, I'm actually quite excited that we're still on the positive. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> That's a great job there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. The next item on the agenda is um, Dr. Kavanaugh's superintendent's report. Thank you. Uh, so my superintendent's report is a little bit longer this evening. Um, I have um, included in the superintendent's report the enrollment uh, projection and a very brief budget update and then just some very cheerful happenings in our schools. I always think that that's my favorite part of the superintendent's report. So as Mrs. Rothmick just said, we engaged in a capacity study. All you're going to get tonight is just a very quick preview, but the part that you're seeing tonight is the enrollment projection for the Hopkinton Public Schools over the next 10 years and how that data came to be. Um, eventually, when we get the entire capacity study, you'll get something from the architect so that you can sort of see what we need to do with our buildings in Hopkinton so that we can accommodate the number of kids who have already arrived and the number of students who will arrive over the next decade. So this demographic and forecasting uh, report was done by Dr. Arthur Wagman. He is an educational consultant, and he works closely with DRA architects. Um, he is not on their staff, but rather a subcontractor. And as I'm going through this report for um, 
just a little bit of definition. When we say demographic analysis, that refers to the process that he used to examine the environmental context of the school district that might affect student enrollment. And forecasting is simply the term that we use to talk about the projection of future events, in this case, student enrollment. And it's very important to point out that while he does his scientific best, he will often say to me, Carol, this is like catching wind. You have to remember that all we can do is take all of the factors before us, put something together, and then the only way that accuracy can be predicted is by looking at where we are in two years, three years, five years, and 10 years. So what had been happening in past years, people would say all the time, why is it that we never quite get it right? And I think that that happened because we were using primarily cohort, cohort survival methodology and birth rate data. And so on that right-hand side, cohort survival is calculated based on the number of students who move from one grade level to the next. And what we do is we take a look at how many of those kids stay in that grade. Uh, is there, are there more kids coming in? Have many kids left? And then an algorithm is developed. Um, and then obviously we look at birth rate data. But that has not been given us a very good projection. And it hasn't. And we, what we've done is we've actually looked at uh, how many people are buying homes that are resales. Because that kind of stuff would not necessarily be captured in, in cohort survival. So when we have a net gain of 189 students, so we have a net gain of 160 students, when we start looking at that, we, we wonder where did all of those kids come from? So sometimes it is from resale, and sometimes it's from new housing developments. So if you look at the bulleted list on the left, in addition to cohort survival methodology and birth date rate, rate data, what Dr. Wagman has done for us is he's looked at new housing developments. He has looked at home resales. So what is the in-out migration for home resales? And then finally, he's looked at open land. How much more land is there in Hopkinton that is likely to be buildable and that you know, we could anticipate there being you know, small developments on, six houses, eight houses, 10 houses. So where does Dr. Wagman get all of this data? Uh, he gets enrollment reports for 2009 and 2010, and uh, from the 2009-10 school year through the 1920 school year, that comes from the Hopkinton Public Schools, and it also comes from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. What we should assume is that the information that DESE has is information that this district supplied to them. So those two, those sets of numbers should sort of be in sync with each other. Uh, birth rate data. Uh, were supplied by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Registry of Vital Statistics. The Hopkinton Building Department provided the number of housing permits annually from 2000 to 2019. Information relative to new and proposed housing developments and subdivisions were provided by John Gelsich, Hopkinton's principal planner. Information relative to Hopkinton's real estate market and relevant market data. Uh, were gleaned from Zillow and interviews with local real estate brokers, and additional information came from discussions just with other individuals and re residents who Dr. Wagman deemed to have what he would consider to be first-hand knowledge. So the prediction from Dr. Wagman is that our enrollment is going to continue to increase, um, and it's going to continue to increase uh, in, in very large ways immediately, and then after a while, there'll be more of a slowing trend. So just some of the data that he shared with me, I pulled out some of the pieces that I thought would sort of illustrate for you the kind of work that he did. Um, peak birth rates in 2016, our number was 159, 2017, 176, 2018, 147, 2019, 149, and that number is extrapolated because we haven't hit December 31st yet. But prior to 2016, the birth rates ranged from about 118 to 133. So you can see the birth rates have gone up fairly significantly in Hopkinton. He read the 2017 master plan, and Hopkinton has developed, we don't have to tell you this, but I will reiterate it, uh, lots of new rental apartments, large condominium complexes, and single family homes. Um, to sort of point out the sort of explosion in building, in 2007 and 2008, only 27 building permits were issued in each one of those years. In 2016, 385 building permits were issued in the town of Hopkinton. 
Uh, when he spoke with realtors, they reported that about 80% of their clients say that they are moving to Hopkinton specifically for the public schools. And the overall population in Hopkinton has grown from 14,925 in 2010 to 17,974 in 2018. So those are just some of the examples of the data as to why we think you know, our school district is going to continue to grow in student enrollment. Uh, some of the other things that he pointed out is that people really are willing to pay to live in Hopkinton. On the left-hand side, Zillow rates Hopkinton's housing market as being very hot with a median house price of 593, but when we looked at what was real, the estimated median list price of homes listed for sale in Hopkinton as of October 1st, 2019 was actually about 649,000. The average median rental unit price in Hopkinton is $2,863 a month. Naturally, you're going to get more square footage here, but that number actually exceeds the average median rental unit price in both Boston and Cambridge. Um, of the 300 home sales roughly in 2018, there was a net increase of 130 school-aged children. And you can just sort of see the real estate valuations in nearby communities, and you can see where Hopkin is at, Hopkinton is at the tippy top, and people are willing to pay to be there. So based upon the rate of new residential construction, a really active real estate market, in migration of new students, a very stable birth rate, and the quality of this school system, we have to prepare for a future that's going to be different from the past. According to Dr. Wagman's work, next year's estimated net gain student enrollment is about 234 additional students. And so it's probably appropriate at this time to remind people that over the last several years, we've taken in about 500 kids. And that's net, 500 students. So if you think about one of our elementary schools, you can pick Elmwood, you can pick Hopkins. We have about 550 kids, almost 600 in those buildings now. But if we turn the clock back three years, we had about 500 kids in those buildings. And they would have been spread out over about 24, 25 different classrooms. We have gotten 500 new kids, and aside from Marathon being bigger than the old center school, we really have not added a single classroom. Right? So we have a huge space issue that's kind of going on in our schools right now, and if 234 does bear out, we are going to have an even bigger problem when we're sitting here next year. So we really feel like at this point we need to have something in place for us to be able to open our doors and accommodate our kids next September 1st in 2020. What you're seeing here are the 10-year projections according to his work. Uh, you can see that the growth for 2021 is 6.1% differential with the 234 kids. But then you can sort of see that if you look at, and he's broken down by grades K to 5, 6 to 8, 9 to 12 at the bottom. And those numbers get a little bit smaller, 68, 50, 77, 148, 105. Uh, those are you know, sort of the projections of how many kids will come into our schools in those years. I think some really important numbers for us, um, is the total pre-K to 12 enrollment in the year 2029-2030. If you look at that, we're talking about 4,856 students according to his work. That's just under 5,000. When I began working in Hopkinton only a few years ago, we were at about 3450. And today, if we look at our kids who go to Keefe Tech, kids who are outplaced, but all of the kids for whom we are sort of financially responsible, we are over 3,900 students. And so there's an additional 1,000 on there. We know we've gotten 500 kids. So we're really talking about classroom space for 1,500 students because we haven't done a thing yet. So how are we going to accommodate for 1,500 kids who will arrive in the next 10 years and who have arrived in the last several? Uh, what you're seeing here is the um, projected kindergarten enrollment. And I think that that's, those are kind of important numbers for us as well. That's, you know, again, a really hard number to determine because once you know the number of first graders that you have and you can sort of develop algorithms, look at resales and all of that, you can get a much better handle on it. But that will help you to understand where we anticipate going um, with our kindergarten. 
But it's interesting because those kindergarten numbers actually get just a little bit smaller. So if you look at the year 2029, 2030, and you look at what's projected for some of our high school classes, we're looking at a grade 9 class of 411 students, grade 10, 423, grade 11, 416. Those are enormous graduating classes. So I contend that we need to act, and we need to act swiftly. Our schools right now are already too small, and we anticipate those 1,000 kids over the next 10 years. So we need to come up with a 10-year plan. And on December 5th, you will be able to see what that 10-year plan looks like with sort of um, renderings of buildings so that you'll actually be able to see physically what those buildings look like and what spaces we would be hoping sort of to put them on. Um, right now, if we use MSBA figures, Elmwood is technically 20,000 square feet, too small. Hopkins, 12,000 square feet, too small. And the high school, 30,000 square feet, too small. Um, so what we are going to be asking for at special town meeting are um, modular classrooms for Elmwood and Hopkins, and a six classroom additional build out at the high school. So I hope that you will all be able to get to that public forum on December 5th. It will be 6 o'clock right here at the high school. Our meeting will be in the auditorium so that we can get people there so that you can start to hear a little bit more about the need for some of those modular classrooms. I know that people may be questioning, well, should we be buying modular classrooms or should we be building? And um, one other piece that I should share with you is that we have a statement of interest in right now with the Mass School Building Authority. If you get invited into their pipeline, it's typically about five years from the time that you're invited in to the time the kids are actually walking into a brand new school building. And so I, I think that we're in a place where we need to have something temporary but also fiscally responsible in place. And you will learn more about what that looks like when, when we meet on December 5th. Questions from the committee before I go on? Questions? I just had, uh, this is excellent work. Um, so appreciated, and it obviously represents a ton of uh, analysis. I, I'm curious about the big drop off in student, net new students um, between 2021 and 21 like, We go from a really high number to a really low number. It seems abrupt. Mm -hmm. I was just curious if there was any Talk commentary on that. Well, your question was exactly Susan's question, so I'll let you answer it because. So what um, Dr. Wagman had done was looking at those developments and the number of developments that are in progress. Mm -hmm. um, so we, he came up with that total number of estimates. So for instance, if you're building a four-bedroom home using um, the U.S. data, how many students would typically end up in a four-bedroom home if you're building a one-bedroom etc. Came up with an estimate of the number of students that would come out of all those building projects that are out there now. What, because so many of them are in progress, that total number of student um, add to the system, half of which he assumed will be in this year. That's why you see such a large amount um, added to the fiscal year 20, because many are either going to finish in this in this fiscal year and a lot of them the kids are already here okay. so you see that large ad in fiscal year 20 so he took those um, building projects and basically took them out three years so half of that building project he assumed is is here or coming in this fiscal year and then the next two are divided by two years excuse me it makes sense I don't know if it feels I don't know, I mean, based on the trend, already 234 is fewer than we had this year. And we've had a three-year trend. I don't know, I feel really uncomfortable. I mean, to me, there's already a, state, a statement of urgency, so it doesn't really matter. But I would, I would definitely be a little suspect. I think it's a little suspect, that number. Um, Dr. Cavanaugh, I feel I, I'm grateful for all your work and the capacity study. But I feel a little bit like I'm waiting for the release of a blockbuster in 20 some odd days and I think the rest of the community might be feeling that too I mean what are you going to reveal in 20 some odd days because you know there's going to be a heck mm -hmm. of a lot of conversation about that starting right now until that moment yes so week preview 
sneak preview. <laughs> so I, I will just give you a, a little inkling as to what we're thinking about. Um, if you look at the buildings that you have on this side of Hayden Row, you've got Hopkins, a middle school, and a high school. And the middle school that you have here now is in need, I think, of some renovation. Um, one of the things that we have talked about with the architects, and we were really sort of leaving this for December 5th, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, is taking that high school, middle school as it exists now and in some way, shape, or form, because the buildings are very close and kids do walk between them very frequently, if those two buildings could be connected, you could create a school that would be for grades 8 through grade 12, for example. Um, and that, that affords you, I think, a little bit more of the kinds of things that parents have asked for. So they'll say, what about my eighth grader who sort of maxes out on, um, at Algebra 1, sort of feels bored. Would there be an opportunity ever for my, my child to take a more advanced math class and putting the eighth grade into that setting with a similar schedule between the two buildings would sort of afford that. Um, as we look at the MSBA work, uh, I would love to be able to look at a school that was a two, three, four, five school. So the four, five would still stay a small school in a school within a school kind of context, and the two, three would be as well. But if all of those students in two almost separate schools exist under one roof, you can save an awful lot of money because you can build special education programming under one roof that complies with state law. You can build better L programs and actually save a whole lot of money on personnel that way because you're not creating, say, for example, a program, a single, singleton in Elmwood, and then a singleton in Hopkins, and then a singleton you know, at Marathon or whatever, you can, you can combine some of that programming. We'd save an awful lot of money if we had only two tiers of busing as opposed to three tiers of busing. So what we need to think about is if you're going to build that great big complex, you're going to get wonderful state reimbursement for that. And then with the other buildings that you have in existence now, if you reconfigure them, you're really going to be able to accommodate a lot more students in a lot more space. In an ideal world, you might be able to have a 6 to 12 campus on this side of the road um, and just have kids who are in grades 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 kind of moving around a campus as if it were, you know, sort of had that, that kind of private school feel. Um, but that comes with a 10-year plan. I mean, that's not going to happen so that by the time we're talking about opening our doors in 2022, voila, it's here. You know, you need, you need architects, you need um, a town meeting and, and a town constituency who says, yes, we, we absolutely value this and this is something that we believe in and want to do. I know that historically the town has not liked um, having schools that were two different, two, three, four, five schools and two different sections of town. This sort of alleviates a whole lot of that. And I'd like for these schools to sort of be all in this, this vicinity because there's a lot of advantage to having your kids educated all in one place. I know people have said to me, oh, what would happen then to Hayden Row? But if you build a driveway that takes cars off of Hayden Row, you alleviate a lot of the traffic on it, which is something I've learned from World Tech Engineering. And the other piece is, if you asked Elmwood parents who pick up, how many of you have a student who's either at Hopkins or Marathon? A very large portion of those people would say, well, I do. So they're coming over here anyway, is sort of the point. Um, but that's all something for people to think about. I'm not an architect. We've engaged with one um, who will be showing us some of these re renderings and um, recommendations, and the recommendations he makes is based on land we already own, open land in town, what's good for education, what's good for us financially, uh, what's predicted in terms of enrollment and demography, and, and I feel like we've done an awful lot of work on this, and, and I hope that people will be there on December 5th to really learn what this could look like. I think this is great, and, and I love that it opens up an opportunity, perhaps, to have a school with a slightly different pedagogical approach. Yes. Um, districts like Acton, they have a Montessori, which is a public school. So I think it would be wonderful, at least, to entertain that notion as we go forward. Mm -hmm. I any other questions from you? Um, I just had a couple of questions. One was related to... Um, the numbers we have seen NESDEC share, mm -hmm. these are looking more realistic uh, for sure, but is there a confidence level that they share in terms of the numbers projected? How confident are we with these numbers? Typically, you know, 
what could that variance look like? Anything around that? I know this is preliminary. I mean, I just sort of go back to uh, you know, his assertion that when you, you know, the only way to know if these numbers are accurate numbers is to live, live the decade. But I do think that there's a lot of compelling evidence, and that's what we have to go with, is the notion that we have taken in 130 students just from resales alone. And when you look at the, the house prices in Hopkinton, and you know, because you live here, that when someone puts up a for sale sign, the house doesn't stay on the market very long. Someone is immediately moving in. And when our realtors tell us that people are coming here for the public schools, it's very important that we continue to have public schools that are sort of state-of-the-art public schools. As Mr. Mr. Hur said, these are really the centerpiece of our community. You know, they really are bread and butter. And if we have vision, and I hope that we do, because I believe that we could build something amazing here in Hopkinton, um, given you know the fact that you're going to have 1,500 new students in a 15-year period, we've got to plan for the future. Someone had said to me that they feel like in Hopkinton we've always done this thing where we were chasing our tail. It would be really nice not to be chasing our tail, but to be planning for a future that is really bright and student-centered. That's, that's absolutely the goal, and I'm, I'm very glad to see the work, the preliminary results that a lot of work has got in, and you shared a lot of uh, you know, the background work and what was the process that led to this, and many thanks to all the folks in town, uh, realtors included, and other folks who have helped come up with these numbers. Um, the other question I have is uh, on, so we are planning the public forum on December 5th. Uh, and we have a meeting next week as well. Um, so perhaps we will have a little bit more information coming back in. Um, and my hope would be that in all this process, as we lay out this plan, we bring the community along in their voices. And that's the whole idea behind the public forum. Yes. Great. Oh, do I keep saying next week? I don't mean to be saying next week. Sorry. Uh, Did someone say something? I'm sorry. When I see December 5th, I keep saying next week, and that's not what I mean. I mean December 5th. Uh, we do have another meeting next week, so I've got a lot of meetings in my head, not that one. I apologize. <laughs> sorry. But we do want you on December 5th for sure. Uh, and then I just have a little bit about the budget process. Again, as Mr. Hur said, we are really, I mean, it doesn't feel like it because on the insides of the schools, we've been working on this for a very long time. Um, what Mrs. Rothermick will present tonight is just the capital side of the budget. But as I have been working with some of the principals to talk about their needs, and we really have tried to stay away from building any new programs in this year, but really just putting faculty in front of kids. I will sort of share where we are right now in terms of dollars and cents, and pardon the pun. Um, but our operational budget at this point in time, there are things that are non-negotiable. So we have teacher salaries, uh, a cost of living increase. They have step raises coming to them. They have lane changes. Uh, we have increases in other personnel contracts. So we have contracts with administrators. We have contracts with the custodians, contracts with the cafeteria workers. Uh, so there would be increases there as well. There will be an increase to the busing contract. Some of our utility costs will go up. Those are all the things, and obviously that's not, you know, the, a fine, that's not a list that includes everything, but it kind of gives you a little flavor for what I mean. But right now, that dollar amount is at 5.5% of the school budget. The personnel requests that I have on the table right now for classroom teachers, specialists, special education teachers, paraprofessionals, secretarial support, and custodial support, that's at 4.5%. Uh, so, just so you have a sense of, of where we are at this point in time. Historically, we've done a very good job of sitting with the principals and being able to sort of whittle down that 4.5% number. I just need to be very clear that this year, it's going to be a lot harder to whittle down that 4.5% because the asks are very real. Um, I've done several broadcasts for HCAM, and one of the things that I point out at Hopkins, for example, this year at the Hopkins School, we have 12 fourth grade classrooms, 12 fifth grade classrooms. Next year, given the enrollment numbers, and these were numbers that we had before Dr. Wagman ever did any of this work for us, 
we had to go to 14 classrooms and 14 classrooms at each grade level. So what that means is we have to hire four teachers in that building, and if we think about, say, $70,000 as the dollar amount on that, we're talking about $280,000 just in four teachers at Hopkins to put teachers in front of kids. And when we look at those teachers, we have to remember that you also need point two of a PE teacher, point two of an art teacher, point one five of a music teacher, and we have to get all of those folks in place as well. Uh, maybe an additional special educator, all of those people come with the increased enrollment. That's where we are right now. I don't want people to get very nervous about this. Over the next several weeks in the budget season, you'll be seeing each of the principals um, individual school budgets, you'll be seeing the director of special education's budget, and so you'll have a much better sense of where the 4.5% is. But I just need to be clear with the community that whittling that down is going to be um, maybe an untenable task this year. And just while we are on that, Dr. Kavanaugh, um, is it fair to say that you have been in uh, conversations with our town partners and these are conversations are happening on an yes. ongoing basis? Absolutely. Okay. Mrs. Rothermick and I met with um, the town manager, Mr. Kamalo, just this week. Okay. Yep. That's great. Thank you. Sure. All right. And this is the most fun part of the show. It's what's new in our schools. It always makes people feel, brings a little levity to the room. Uh, what's going on? Well, we have the Joy of Math games. Uh, Officer Phil and I went by the Elmwood School one day only to catch uh, Mrs. Carver there playing a math game with students who had earned the reward. Uh, we've had the magic of STEAM week. Uh, Mr. Scott, who teaches here at the high school, Technology Engineering, had a girl-powered event on October 24th. At Hopkinton High School, they've enjoyed a pep rally. Uh, you can see all the fanfare there. Um, in the middle, they had announced that the yearbook was going to be dedicated to Liam, and that was his response. It was really nice. Uh, this is a unified basketball shot. I'm trying to encourage the coaches to bring more enthusiasm to the game. <laughs> uh, here's some Halloween pictures from the high school. Mrs. Parson and I were able to enjoy the, the day over there. Uh, here's the Harvest Parade at Marathon Elementary. The Diversity Club at the high school is celebrating Native American Heritage Month. And voila, the donated granite has been installed at the White House. So um, you can see what the kitchen facility looks like. And just to be fair, all of those cabinets were donated. The appliances were donated. The granite was donated. All of that came to us for free. And our students in the 18 to 22 program are thrilled in their new digs. They are loving it. And if I can put in a plug for our capital article to fix the outside of the White House a little bit. All right, we also had Dr. Adolph Brown come in and talk to us. Uh, we had a great professional learning afternoon with him on October 18th. Uh, Dr. Adolph Brown is a, a speaker who does all kinds of things. Um, and as you look at him, he calls himself the other there. And uh, kind of when he comes in, people keep looking and thinking, wow. Is that him? And then eventually all of that exterior is removed and he shows you what he, the you know, sort of PhD um, equity and inclusion speaker looks like and talks about his history and it's just an incredible moving experience. But he res what really resonated with me was his every student is a study of one. And we've had lots of other professional learning going on. Um, if you look at the bottom right, we had a FUSE day where we have FUSE fellows who are working sort of in between different districts across the tech schools. At the top, you can see a high school um, challenge success event going on. And then you can see some teachers who are working at um, Hopkins on our professional learning day. Um, and we've been also doing some walkthroughs. So what you see in the lower left are just some shots that came out of teachers' classrooms. And we were really looking for literacy growth. So it was really exciting to see the relationship there between comprehension and composition. 
And the last thing I want to do is just thank my administrative team for all the hard work and all the professional learning and all the budgeting. What you don't see here tonight is all five of them and their assistants who have, and the director of special education, um, director of technology, they have been working amazingly hard to get all of this stuff done behind the scenes. So that's it. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Kavanaugh. Any questions? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Kavanaugh. It's always nice to see those pictures of kids and, you know, having fun. Uh, thank you for putting the effort in creating a wonderful report here. Um, the next item on the agenda uh, is the SE Chair Report. I have approved the payroll warrants S20009, S20010, and S2010A. Payroll warrants have been included in your packet. I have also approved warrants number 20-020, um, number 20-021, number 20-022, and number 20-023. These warrants have also been included in your packet. Besides that, I have a few other updates. Um, this, from the time we last met, we went to the MASC MASS conference, which was the first time for me, um, and I came all excited, learning so much. Um, and you know, there were a bunch of uh, sessions that were set up, and there were people, educators from everywhere. Uh, you two have been. Uh, to the conference already, so you know that experience. So it was not just about the conversations, but I also felt that they had vendors, they had um, you know school committee members from all over the state. So there was much to learn on that front. Um, and uh, for me, some of the highlights that I attended, one was the, on the budget front, communicating the budget with transparency and trust. There was one session that I attended related to Beyond Us, a story of the struggle to fit in, which I thought um, you know, talked a little bit beyond diversity and inclusion to get into a sense of belonging, right? How do we make sure that f folks feel they belong? So I thought that was wonderful. Um, also, there was a session on protecting student data in a technology-driven world where Mr. Ghosh spoke. I went primarily to support that was not exactly the thing I was most excited about, but there were exciting aspects that came up, and of course, we had our tech partners there, so that was fabulous. Um, also, um, one of the sessions that I attended was on busing and busing blues, challenges and opportunities in um, MA student transportation. And I met, um, um, Ms. Colleen Kavanaugh there, who is the MAPT, um, one of the folks who, uh, ladies, who, people who work there, and um, she was fabulous, and she talked about, you know, what are the opportunities and savings that can be done in terms of transportation. Apparently, if you're a member of that organization, MAPT, which I believe Hopkinton is, they're able to come out and do an assessment of what or how our transportation is, and suggest some efficiencies, and they charge about $3,000. Um, and so I was excited about that. I do want to talk to Dr. Kavanaugh about it at some point, if that's something that we can look to do um, in the upcoming year. I also had a chance to interact with school committee members from Lexington, from Holliston, from Framingham, and Somerville. And we talked about a bunch of things, you know, what are things that are exciting that are happening in their districts? Uh, what are some of the challenges that they have? And of course, they wanted to know what's happening in our district. And uh, they seem to have heard about growth in our community. And we talked a little bit about growth and diversity. And, you know, Dr. Kavanaugh, you talked about this earlier. To me, the, the message that I was trying to share with them is that we have leaders in our district where we are looking at growth as an opportunity. This is not something, you know, yes, we feel the pain right now, but this is not a burden. This is an opportunity for us to be better to what you were talking about with the master plan. And, you know, you were talking about the two through uh, five model. Those are things we can do. We anyway have to do some of this work. Now that we are growing, we are likely to have a new building here. Um, so if we are doing that, perhaps we need to look at a different pedagogical model. You know, these are all opportunities for us, really. Um, and that's how I presented it. I know we're feeling the pain, but we really, really need to look at growth as an opportunity is what I felt strongly. Um, besides that, in terms of... Um, uh, 
correspondence. Um, I received two, uh, two emails from uh, two different parents on uh, some concerns with related to transportation, one of which was related to policy, and I shared that we're going to have a policy uh, working group meeting this week and we will get tomorrow back morning. tomorrow morning and uh, we will get back to them as to what the decision is on when we can do uh, in terms of all the policies that we have what the timeline would be um, and uh, you know I've requested Dr. Kavno if it's possible to share some of the statistics but I'm sure that's in consideration along with everything else uh, you have going on. Besides that, there was an invite from um, CPAC for an information session which I attended, which I thought was great. It was done uh, by, with CPAC and Dr. Zaleski, they did it together. And they also got someone from Needham. I, I just love the idea to learn from other districts. And um, this lady came from Needham who has been the chair, co-chair of the CPAC, and she shared how their journey has been. So that was very helpful and informative for me. The planning board invited us to um, join them for a discussion on the Legacy Farm North bus stop. I attended that last night, that meeting. Um, I thought that, uh, you know, I applauded them that they've taken leadership in that area. That's still work in progress. There were a lot of pros and cons that were discussed. And uh, I just made a suggestion if they would consider creating a task force that looks at all these options and um, looks at um, a solution, possible solution. But in terms of um, our role on the school side, I think we have been very consistent that, you know, we have certain limitations, but we are willing, are willing partners. Besides that, um, there was also, um, uh, there, I have an invite from um, EHOP. Uh, they are going to be doing an info session with the Chinese American Association of Hopkinton uh, in the first week of December. I just received this email. They asked me to join and share some of the work that the school committee does and uh, you know how they can access some of the information. So if you're all okay with that, I would like to attend that session. Um, and I'll share that email with all of you as well. Um, Besides that, I'm excited about the public forum. I have something noted down, which I myself can't figure out what it is. <laughs> uh, so I think that's plenty of updates. Uh, any questions? Yeah? Okay, great, thank you. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, um, the next item on the agenda, of course, is the school committee office hours. We had talked about a potential office hours this month. Uh, but I'm wondering with the public forum coming up, perhaps we should put our energies in that space. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Okay. On to liaison reports. Reports. Updates. I have two quick reports. Um, the website subcommittee is going to be sending out, I believe, Monday, maybe Sunday night, but I think it'll be Monday, a survey to the community. Um, the families in the district, the staff, as well as the greater community to get a read on how well the new website is meeting the needs of the community. We had taken a survey before we did the project and we want to see how well we delivered. So um, you can look for that in your email inbox. I think it will be posted in a variety of, on a variety of websites around town um, for citizens who are <coughs> not affiliated with the schools and I think it will go out in a listserv. So um, we're excited. Please um, take Five minutes, I think, is all it takes to do the survey, and we're really hoping to get some, some feedback on how we're doing. Um, just so people know, I think the um, IT department will use the results of that survey to kind of shape and inform any modifications um, going forward. So um, the other update I have quickly is that um, I attend the HOP Coalition meeting this week. And um, for those who don't know, the HOP Coalition is a group, a cross-section of the town, basically um, first responders, Hopkinton Youth and Family Services, um, school um, counselors, people who work in pediatrics, and um, a variety of people who come together with the goal of um, preventing uh, substance use and abuse, so particularly in, in families um, and kids. So we um, had a very good meeting, two things relevant to the schools, the Board of Health reported that they were able to get grant funding to upgrade our Narcan. Um, it has a shelf life. Ours is 
nearing its the end of its shelf life. It was grant funded originally, and they worked really hard to get grant funding so that we can replace our Narcan in the schools, which is exciting. Um, and uh, let's see what else. Um, and I think this week, if I'm not mistaken, in the high school, they um, began some vaping presentations in conjunction with uh, a company called Genesis. And they are being offered to freshmen. And um, it was Ms. Kylie Murray, who's a guidance counselor, who reported on that. She said they are working out the kinks, but they're going well. And the students are very engaged in the conversation. And they're really explaining to kids the dangers of vaping. Um, their plan is to then uh, roll that out to juniors. So freshmen and juniors will be getting this <coughs> presentation. And there's a lot of other work going on um, for families who are concerned about you know, vaping or substance use. There is a lot of work going on. I would encourage people to reach out to Hopkinton Youth and Family Services if you have any questions um, about this topic in general. They have a lot of resources. Thank you. Any other updates? Uh, just one that the Hopkinton Subcommittee for the calendar mm -hmm. met um, and discussed the results of the survey. Uh, it, it was it was quite a popular survey, I have to say. A good number of parents filled it out. So I was glad to see that and to see the variety of responses about the dates. Yeah, I think we had almost 1,400 people respond to that survey, which is unheard of. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Do you and have I any, think any info for any details? December 2nd? Share? Next month. Yes. Yeah, next month. Now you're leaving us with a cliffhanger. I know. Yeah. Block, there's a blockbuster we coming. Go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering what we should name the public forum to get more maximum participation. Harry Say math, math pathways. That always gets a big. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Every time we've had a discussion on math pathways, we get attacked. Yeah. That's good to know. Well, I do think that the set calendar subcommittee will also have a recommendation for you shortly because okay, I, we went through that data. It was great. So. That's great. Any other updates, Meg? No. Okay. okay. Uh, Nancy, I spoke a little bit about the MAC conference. Did you want to speak anything about that? No, I thought it was great. I thought there were some really great uh, sessions. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. Actually, I remembered what I wrote. Um, this was the Budget Advisory Council. I'd been in touch with, um, you know, Mr. Ted Stone and Mr. Manning, and we're finally seeing some <coughs> moment, and hopefully we'll catch up next week, just oh, kickstart the conversation. Um, there were some concerns expressed about, you know, are we feeling too much of oppression? It was very nice of Mr. Hur to come out and yes. share and uh, share the support that uh, the select board feels. Um, so hopefully that conversation will continue. Um, okay. So that's what we have for liaison reports. New business. Item A, Center Trail, Chamberlain Street. Do we have Mr. Lagoy here? Yes, we do. Great. Hello. Welcome. Good evening. Peter, Peter Lagoy. I'm chairman of the Hopkinton Trail Coordination and Management Committee. TCMC, which is, we started using the acronym because for obvious reasons, and I sort of forget what the name of the actual committee is now. Um, the reason I'm here is we're, do you have the, the bottom half of this picture? Can you slide it up a little uh, bit? If not, we can, can I can talk through happen. this one, but it'd be, it'd be better if we showed the bottom. Yeah, there we go. Oop, Oop, have I gone too far for you? <coughs> Keep coming. Perfect. That's good. Okay. Okay. So just to orient folks, that little spur, green spur coming in is the center trail where it comes in on the loop road. The red dotted line along here is going along the loop road itself. And then where it comes down and does this kind of curve in the right hand corner here, that's the trail, the center trail that goes out to Chamberlain Street, which is down here. As you know, there's a new Chamberlain addition going in with a bunch of houses there. Part of the planning board's agreement with that developer is to put some trails to allow people in that development to connect directly over to the school. Um, at the same time, sort of that's going on. Our committee is looking for, I mean, we're a relatively new committee, less than a year old. 
our first sort of big project, priority project, to kind of work out the bugs of how we do trails in town. We wanted to connect Barry Acres, which is in the far corner there, through this to the school. There are already trails in there, but in the process of talking to folks, it looked like actually a great opportunity because these folks need to have trails and we can beef those up a little bit using Community Preservation Act money. And what we're looking at doing is to connect here um, that red dotted line or the green line, we haven't picked the actual path, um, out to that development. And then on that north side, again, go across, that's by field 11, but we may actually connect it up to the center trail and connect that again over to that new development. Um, as I said, CPA money for that. The reason I'm here is because obviously that green land is land that the school committee controls. There's a Hopkins Area Land Trust has a conservation restriction on it, so I have to work with them on their conservation piece, but you guys are officially the owners, so we need to get your okay to put that trail in. Um, where I am in the process right now is in front of the Community Preservation Committee with a proposal to do that work. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking for is your guys okay for us to put that trail in. As far as timing, it would be money frees up in beginning of July, so we try to get it started in the um, you know September October time period. Um, so and then just sort of in terms of long term, we're also looking at going from the other end and trying to you can there's state grant money that you can get. The town has to provide a certain amount of matching funds. We'd want to use the CPA money here as matching funds for a state grant to then connect down to the Lumber Street Commercial District. The idea being you'd be able to connect from Charles View, from that part of town, you know, on a Saturday morning, go down to the Spoon on bikes, uh, Stone Dust Trail down to there. It also gives the cross-country teams and the distance running teams about a three-mile loop where they would be, uh, have only one not even that busy road crossing, which I live in the center of town in Hayden Row. I watch the cross-country kids, of which my son is one, come across church place without looking and I watch drivers turn into church place without looking all the time and the more we can get them places to run where there is not that car runner conflict the happier I am mm. so uh, any questions and I think this is such important work that you're doing and I'm grateful for it the more we can get people out of their cars and onto the paths on bikes or on foot, the better for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, did you have any question? I just was going to ask if um, Mr. Person had had a, an opportunity to look at this or if you had any comments just from the schools. I don't know if he's uh, looked at this new okay. one. I think he did back when not. Jane yeah. was here. Yeah. I know last time we had gone for a little look at, uh, and I know it's cold now, uh, so I was wondering if anyone's interested in taking a look at it or spend more time or uh, what do we want to do? Just throwing it out there. Well, there's no official, well, there are sort of walking trails in there, but it's it's a little bit of a bushwhack, right. particularly on the southernmost. It might be better to wait until the trails have been constructed rather than <laughs> clamber through the bush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I, was, I think you were asking earlier, and I was having a small conversation here. So are we okay with this? What's, uh, have you had any conversations or had a chance to look at this? I, I know that we have talked with um, Jane, and Jane has presented um, extensively. And I know that this is going through that center, which is considered the, you know, what is under the land trust. It isn't land that the school department would ever be able to use. Okay. Um, so constructing trails through there is a very good use of, of that property. 
in connecting trails as has been presented both by Jane and, and uh, um, Peter here. Um, you know, Tim and I have reviewed that in a very general premise and we both agree that it's a, it's a good project for the schools. Okay. It's not land that we can do anything with. Okay, that's that's fabulous. Okay. Do we have any concerns about um, accessing this land? You said maybe a September start. So, um, how do you how do the trucks get here? Do you, you know would are we concerned about traffic or disruption of the cross country team or any mm -hmm. anything on the school property in terms of accessing that? I would work with, with Tim and then with the coaches just to make sure it stays out of their way. But we okay. haven't had a problem with that in the past. Yeah. Um, we could probably come in off of Chamberlain, the new Chamberlain edition. Okay. Once, I mean, because that's pretty much in right now. Yeah. So there are, there are ways to do it. Okay. So Peter has been instrumental in constructing the middle school cross country trail. So, I mean, this is something that he's already done the equipment I mean we've already worked with him and and seeing how that all operates so I'm sure it would work seamlessly with with Tim and, and getting this done that would not um, in, disrupt the schools right great. Great. can great. I make a motion to approve the construction of the trails second okay second uh, motion by Megan is second by Amanda second yes great all those in favor? Aye. Yes. I'm a yes as well, so that carries. Thank you, Mr. Lagoa. I do want to echo my uh, colleague's sentiments here. Meg Tyler mentioned that. Um, you know, you bring that passion for trails. It's so important that you and so many of your colleagues on the board do so much work, and the community benefits deeply from it. Um, I shared that in my email. I'm a big fan of the Echo Trail. Uh, and I look forward to this work and completion and everybody enjoying it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Glad I came in for the tail end of it. Oh, thank you. We held up your job. All right. Well uh, the next item on the agenda is the visitor management system. Mr. Ghosh. Good evening. Good evening. I'm here tonight just to give the school committee an update on the new visitor uh, management systems that we have in the schools. I thought I'd just read the memo that I submitted to the superintendent um, just so the community has a good idea of what the message is. Um, visitor management systems have been implemented across all school buildings as a final stage of a multi-step security initiative that started five years ago. Each school will have a self-service kiosk in its main entrance that will guide parents and guests through the visitor process. Beginning November 15th, all Hopkinton Public Schools now require a driver's license or some sort of public ID to enter into our buildings during school hours. The new system will leverage your driver's license number to check your name against the National Sex Offender Registry prior to being issued a visitor badge. Please note that from time to time there are false positives because a person's name may align closely with another person in the registry. If this occurs, administration and school resource officers will work with a visitor to resolve the issue. So I'm happy to entertain questions and just kind of give some background information about it. Obviously this came uh, about from a security audit that was conducted by BCM you know, over five years ago. And as part of that audit, there was a recommendation for these systems. The system is, is a, basically a, a computer uh, with a screen that has uh, printers attached to it that print badges. Um, we've piloted the system at the high school for at least nine months um, on a trial basis and have learned from that uh, and then have put uh, four other systems in the other buildings over the last week or so to, to try them and to make sure they were working properly. Uh, and from what we learned uh, working with the high school uh, in regards to some of these false positives, we kind of worked uh, through a procedure uh, with all of our main office staff and the Hopkinton Police Department to make sure we know how to, to deal with any issues that arise. And so uh, it's been working pretty well, and all of the secretaries and main office staff have been trained, and um, it seems to be off to a good start. Uh, in terms of the false positives, uh, it's typically, it's, it's a name recognition system, so it's typed in. And sometimes if someone has a slightly different middle initial or there's an exact match of the name, it is, it is possible to have a, a false positive. If that's the case, the police department just checks uh, and then they're cleared still and we, we issue a badge. 
And once that happens, what we are doing is putting them into a, a pre-approved list so that if they come back or actually go to another school because they have a child in another building, uh, they'll be on that pre-approved pre list and they won't have that issue um, again. So we've worked through some of those over the last couple weeks. But I'm happy to entertain any questions or answer any thoughts that you may have. And questions? Sounds very time consuming. Um, the installation itself or just well, the management of it all? Let's come in, give their license, have it checked. Yeah. It's have you done it? No. I've had an opportunity going out of the high school to do it. It's um, The first time I went through, I, I didn't know it was going to be there. It was a surprise. But it's <laughs> really actually very quick. And you don't have to write your badge. It just prints it for your sticker for you. It's, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't find it to be time consuming. It was surprising yeah. at first. So I think people will be caught off guard. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons that we asked Mr. Ghosh to come tonight because it's really nice for people to hear this in this setting rather than to just get to the kiosk, you know, sure. at the Elmwood Elementary School, for example. If there is a false positive, mm. are those people told in that moment? So if there is a false positive, you know, we have that person work directly with the principal, okay. you know. Yeah, and, and that's part of the reason we're talking about it now and saying that that does, that does exist. I mean, in the trial at the high school, we had a number of false positives that happened, and they're, they're notified, they know what's going on, but we also want to make the community aware that it does happen, just stay calm, and it's not, you know. I think in, our hope in the end is we're trying to make school safer and not try to make it harder for parents to come into the schools. Um, and, and at the same time, it's used for other purposes. I mean, the other thing we'd like to do with it is to also work with custodial agreements that we have. So, right, some, some parents may not have custodial rights to their child. And the one way to make sure that we're overseeing those, those rules uh, implied by courts is to have a system that can help us do that in busy days. So if someone has an issue, we can load that into the system and it's a second check so that we make sure that they're not getting in front of those kids if they're not supposed to be. So, question about the false positives. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody comes up with a positive, is there a way to ascertain that, in fact, it's a false positive and not, in fact, an actual positive? The, the police department's able to say the, that? Yeah, the, the, police, the police department has to carry that out, and they will have to take the driver's license and the name, and then they will, they will call the center, and they will make a determination about why. Who it is and there's actually a way to verify with a picture as well so the other okay. the other thing Let's is there's it. a picture that comes up and then that's also a match say oh that's obviously not this person the name was closed but it's not them they get pre-approved uh, and they're allowed to enter the building okay. um, I have a couple of questions for you mr. Ghosh one if someone doesn't have a driver's license well what do they, what's the process Ideally, we'd like some sort of government-issued ID, if possible, whether it's a passport or some sort of uh, picture ID to verify that the person is saying who they are to match the name. Okay. Um, without that, we're just going based on name, and there's no real way to verify they are who they say they are. So will they be able to, you know, and again, I'm just trying to make the distinction that, you know, we'll still continue to have the Cody checks for any kind of interaction with kids. Correct. Right? This is simply to enter, let's say, to drop off or, you know, meet with the principal or things of that nature. Is that right? right? This isn't even for dropping off or, let's say, you forget your lunch and you're coming in to just drop your lunch off. This right. is, you're coming to meet with someone in the main office. Okay. You're coming to visit the, a classroom teacher for a meeting okay. um, during school hours. Those are the, the main times that this is, is utilized. Right. Okay. So, so the Corey aspects remain and this is simply for, let's say, meeting the principal. So, um, so you're saying that if you don't have a driver's license, some other government approved, uh, government issued mm -hmm. identification is needed. Correct. Yep. And the Cory rules are still the Cory rules, right? right? I mean, if you don't have a Cory check and you're coming to the building, obviously you have to be escorted by a staff member into an office space or two with a teacher. So those yeah. rules are still in place. Right. Yeah. And I just don't want to. Uh, I just wanted that clarified. Sure. But uh, but this check could run against a state-issued ID as well. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so we, mm -hmm. we may just want to uh, say that. I don't know, are we looking for any kind of a motion today? 
No, we're not. This was really just informational. Um, I want to thank Mr. Ghosh and his team because, you know, you really are keeping Hopkinton ahead of the curve, as usual. Um, and I think that it's an awful lot of work to set up all of these systems, to train our secretarial staff and our principals, and then just to ensure that, you know, the public is aware of what we're doing and why we're doing it. And at the end of the day, it's really about student safety. So. Yeah, and it's exciting. I mean, this is, you know, exciting for us that we're we're nearing and hopefully the community that nearing the end of our our audit that's been ongoing for <laughs> over six years so we've been working over six years to meet all of those points and all those goals in that audit so coming you know this summer you know depending on the budget and the final capital articles that Susan's going to be talking about later the last set of cameras will be going into the schools um, and the audit will be will be done which will be great well so um, so we're excited about that that's and we can move on to other things. All right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Ghosh, uh, you, know, I do, you probably missed that. I mentioned uh, and shared with the committee, you presented very well at the MAC conference oh, thank you. the other day. Thank, thank you. Thank that you was very fun. much. That was exciting. It's great to be part of the data privacy issues that are going on. And, and so hopefully patients are, or parents are being patient and, and working with us to get some of the final parental consents that we've been sending out. So if you haven't had an opportunity to fill out that form, I know everyone's been, you know, overwhelmed with surveys and forms, but there is a, a uh, form uh, in PowerSchool that we're asking parents to kind of uh, complete. And we've got about halfway there. So once we have that, we'll be, we'll be good to go. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. So um, we we are moving along. Uh, you know, don't Nancy reminds me to say it, uh, and I'm just trying to um, check with everyone. Uh, we also have uh, Jen here. If you want to move around a little bit and. Um, get into some of the budget and the capital plan items first just wondering yeah the people who are in attendance might appreciate that. right so uh, are we okay with uh, going to item i on the capital plan Ms. Rothmick, does that sound okay to you that is fine okay so taking um, some mm -hmm. of the business out of order here um, and moving on to capital plan item i Um, thank you. So hopefully this will be informative um, for everyone that is in attendance. When we have gone through um, the capital plan, some of the things that you'll see, not only are we looking at the um, mechanicals and the infrastructure within the buildings, but also looking long term at what we've talked about with um, Dr. Kavanaugh in terms of where we are with our, our buildings. jump six slides on. I know that's <laughs> what was my okay so um, just starting off uh, briefly so the fiscal year 21 capital plan what we are looking for um, our HVAC district district wide 250,000 boiler replacement 160,000 roof replacement 4 million vehicle 59,500 system wide security upgrades 200,000 system-wide technology upgrades 100,000 the Elmwood feasibility study 700,000 Elmwood portable classrooms at 2 million Hopkins portable classrooms at 3 million high school addition at 5 million renovation of the White House exterior at 206,000 and wetlands order of conditions at 60,000 so what I'll do is I will go through each one of those individually that was just quickly what is on there in total so the HVAC district-wide this represents two units for next year one at the high school and one at Hopkins 
and this will basically begin a systematic plan of replacing the larger HVAC units throughout the district. There are 38 of these units throughout the district, so going at two at a time is still looking at 14 years. And keep in mind that Hopkins and the high school opened, um, they're already at 20 years old. So to give you an idea, and of course the middle school is even older. Um, so this right now is looking for two when you look at a 10 year projection, we're trying to chunk it out two at a time. It may have to get more aggressive knowing what that life would be um, by the time we get there. So these are two units that have been identified for next year. The boiler replacement, uh, this is the second unit of the boilers in the middle school. So you can see the size um, of these units that we're talking about. The first boiler is what is asked for and is in the design and engineering phase this year. And this would represent the second one for the middle school. And these are basically the largest boilers we have in the district. And again, just looking at, you can see um, what we're talking about in terms of size. And these were installed in 1994, to give you an idea of the age. Roof replacements, we are looking at two, re two partial roof replacements, one at Hopkins and one at the middle school. This is the uh, roof engineering that is going on currently in this year. What we've done is gone through the roofs at both of the buildings. There has been leak tests, there have been test cuts uh, to get an idea of what actually at this point is really at end of life, what needs to be replaced and what can be repaired. So these are just some of the pictures that you can see of the condition of the roof. You can see here where some of it is actually peeling up. Uh, you can see where it's wrinkling um, and just really disintegrating. And then you can see in prior years the number of patches that have been put on um, in this section. And just interestingly, these patches are a different material than the actual roof material itself. So the patchwork that has been done in, in previous years is also incorrect, um, to give you an idea. What is the material of the roof? Uh, so a lot of it is PVC, okay. and those patches are EPDM. It's a different material. So um, there's different materials you can use um, for different reasons. Uh, so the, the pieces that we are looking at, so the, the good news is originally, um, so this is a aerial view of Hopkins. This blue section was done back in 2016. Originally, we thought that this entire section that was not done at that time would have to be replaced. So my original estimate, I believe, was at 5 million. So you see that that number has come down to around 4 million. This purple area, we, they have deemed the engineers that this is repairable. So we can actually push this replacement out um, a few more years. So the green areas on, for Hopkins is what is being recommended to be replaced. This is the aerial view for the middle school. So the blue area, these roofs were put in place in 2008. This back uh, hip here, um, I don't know if everyone remembers that this part actually blew off in a storm last winter. <laughs> uh, so this was only just recently replaced in 2019. That was actually covered by insurance. So that isn't anything that we had to pay for. Um, but the, the issue was this whole roof area was in poor condition anyway. So when we do this, we will marry up with the, the roof that was replaced over the summer. So all this green area for the middle school would have to be replaced um, in this next round of roofing. The vehicle, what you can see here is a, just a, a picture of a rack truck. Uh, currently we have three trucks for our eight staff. These vehicles are used for maintenance, towing, plowing, sanding, et cetera, throughout the whole district. So this would be bringing one more truck online, which would be more efficient. 
you have five staff members when we're um, especially in plowing and sanding uh, don't have a vehicle so this would give us one more vehicle to be able to complete tasks the system-wide security upgrades this represents the final year of the camp new camera installations throughout the district that was outlined in the security task force technology assessment plan that mr. Ghosh just spoke of uh, earlier so this would be 200,000 to complete what was recommended in that audit system-wide technology upgrades these upgrades for next year would represent an upgrade to the phone system and again this is townwide and the bell system uh, the district and town phone IP offices and voicemail servers are at risk of failure without an upgrade and again this is this is district and and townwide and the bell system ironically is still it's 20 years old and is still controlled by this old DOS system um, so our bell schedules cannot be updated Looks so like it belongs in a museum <laughs> it belongs in a museum feasibility study so we spoke a little bit about the fact that we have a statement of interest in with the MSBA for the Elmwood school uh, the feasibility study basically is to procure a study to document the educational program, generate an initial space summary, document existing conditions, and establish design parameters. Basically, what this feasibility study would be then is to present to the MSBA what we think would be the, the direction that that building should take. Um, the nice thing about this is if we are indeed invited into the uh, MSBA process, most of this cost could be reimbursed um, by the MSBA. So the reason that we go out for this now is it puts us ahead. Um, as Dr. Kavanaugh s stated earlier, when you're invited into the MSBA process, it can take five years until you walk into that building. Anything we can do now hoping to be invited in um, and uh, pretty much putting our steps forward will help us to move along in that process and try to tighten up that window if we can make it in less than those five years portable classrooms for Elmwood as we spoke about earlier currently the Elmwood school is estimated to be 20,000 square feet below the MSBA standards for the current enrollment so what we're trying to do really is just put some classrooms there um, that would basically stem the flow, if you will. And this one, uh, people will say, well, why, why would you do portable classrooms when you're hoping to build a project? Again, we're five years away from anything potentially for Elmwood. And the bottom line is, as you look throughout the district, we're below square foot. Um, standards almost in every building and unfortunately that even includes marathon so as we march down this path in this in creating this vision these portable classrooms that we would purchase if we were to then build a building in five years those portable classrooms could be repurposed at another building as we continue on that path of our vi of our vision um, so keep that in mind in terms of our long-term plan may I ask a quick question yeah are those do we purchase those portable classrooms or is it a rental agreement or how does that work so you can lease or you can buy and the sweet spot is probably about five years so if you're going to lease for five years you're better off buying them okay. knowing that we're short in almost every building and depending on how we move and what that vision that we come out with buying them is probably a better deal because then, like I said, you will then be able to move them around to then work on that next building, what that next phase is. Is there a resale market if we decided we didn't need them? There is a resale. Okay. Um, and so this cost, depending when we go out to bid, we could potentially end up with used units. Okay. Um, the, the units that we think we would like to have, however, are stacked units. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, because of the land and the space that we have and the number of classrooms that we need we're most likely looking at a stacked unit 
now the aftermarket for that may be less. Um, but there are schools that will bring in portables, use them for a number of years, and then put them back out on the market. So there is potential that what we buy could be a used unit. Okay. And there is potential that if we decide we would like to get rid of them, there is a market for resale. Okay. That's so, Thank you. and it is completely a supply and demand. Of so course. putting a number on that, it, you wouldn't be able to do that. Right. And Mr. Atomic, what's the experience like? What's the difference between a portable classroom and a more permanent structure? And I Hold that and I'll show you a picture. OK, great. <laughs> so as you see here, this is the portable classroom for um, Hopkins School. And I have the wrong. I apologize. So I say Hopkins portable classrooms. Currently, Elmwood is approximately. So I, I apologize about that. I have that square footage incorrect. I think you have yeah, that the square footage right, but the Just name the wrong. Hopkins is 12, yeah, yeah, but yeah. Elmwood is 20. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I apologize for that typo. So to give you an idea, this is a visual of the inside of a portable classroom. Um, as you can see, they're, they're very well done, uh, very well appointed. Um, they come complete with uh, HVAC, so it would, in, in some schools, um, be a better classroom environment than the classrooms that exist within the building. If I'm not mistaken, that there are, is a desirability at Elmwood for the uh, portable classrooms there because they... That exist. That exist. Um, and yes. those are at least 15 years old. That's correct. What are the yellow things? Is it power? <laughs> or is yeah. it yeah. Those, are, yes. those yeah. actually are drop power cords. Okay, because I see so, outlets too. There's an outlet on the wall as well. Is it both wired and? So this is just a sample classroom. Yeah. Um, you know, we we would design. Well, I won't say we. The engineers would design the specs based on what we need. Okay. So, this is probably we wouldn't have drop power cords. Right. Um, that would be for something if you were doing a computer lab or or something <laughs> that was very specific that you needed the power to that desk. I don't see that specifically for the Elmwood or Hopkins classroom that we would need. Right. So, um, but this is what a stacked portable classroom would look like. Um, so you can see, and they would there would be stairs for Hopkins. We're looking to break through into the stairwell that is at the far end of the bus line. So the, the upper floor would go right into the upper floor of Hopkins, and the lower floor would go right in. Elmwood is a little trickier, and again, I'll leave that to the engineers as to how we would connect that to the building. But this gives you a visual what, of what a stacked portable classroom would look like. And I know there was questions about installation. Uh, so you can see this is just another, or an installation that was going on. You can see where they put in the footings, uh, foundational footings underneath, and then they would literally just lower the portable classroom onto those footings. So that's what an installation um, could potentially look like. Moving on, the high school addition that we spoke about earlier. Uh, again, the high school is currently 30,000 square feet below the MSBA standards for the current enrollment. Working with uh, DRA, our engineers, what they were putting together is a visual of coming out the back of the high school. So currently, if you're in the back of the high school, there are two parts of the building that jut out here and here. This would be a matching um, addition onto the one that is a little bit shorter. So this gives you an aerial view. This is the existing. And this would be an, an addition off the back of this one so that they would actually be the same size. This is an interior uh, look. So you would be adding six classrooms, um, four that are standard classroom size and two that are smaller group. 
The bottom floor, because this is actually where we have our receiving, would actually be an elevated section of the building. So there would not be classrooms on the, on the first floor. And I'll show you that here. So this visual, you can see that that addition is elevated. The number of mechanicals, this is the electrical room, and over here is the receiving for the kitchen. To change those would add to that cost estimate dramatically. So just elevating this piece and getting six classrooms out up here and leaving that first floor empty um, keeps our costs down. Does that get us that 30,000 square feet? It does not get you 30,000 square feet. But I guess one thing that I would like to point out about that, when you um, think about the student enrollment that this building was built for in terms of classrooms, it was just over 1,000. So you'd be talking about like 1,050 kids. Um, if you think about how many kids we have in this building today, we are well over 1,200 kids in the building now. And if you go back to the slide I had showed previously, where would we be in 2029? With only three grades in this building, we'd still be over 1,200 kids. So we need that space. And if we were able to somehow link this again with the middle school and have a five grade configuration in what now houses really seven, we'd be in much better sp uh, shape space-wise. So the White House exterior renovation, as we've spoken about, we have done the interior renovation really through donations um, and just have done a wonderful job with creating a program and a usable space uh, within the building. What we need to really focus on now is the exterior of the building, the siding, the windows, and the roof. Um, this has been on the capital uh, requests in previous years, and it has always been bumped along. You know, as we know, when you're looking for capital, not everything survives the budget process, and this is one of the projects that has been asked for in previous years and has never survived the budget process. Um, but you can see the condition that we're looking at now. This eave is completely open, um, and the shingles have disintegrated to a point where there's a, probably a really good chance you'll see a blue tarp over that roof uh, pretty soon. Uh, so that, that's the condition that, that what we're left with now. And the wetlands order of conditions, this is something that just keeps bumping along. Um, in fiscal 19, we had asked for the full cost of that wetland replication, which was 100,000. And again, as we say, um, money is finite. So we did cut this request last year in order to get through the budget process to 40000 But in order to completely close out this project that has been open since 2000, the year 2000, um, we need that additional 60000 to do that wetland replication and close this out. Questions? I think this was a great presentation, Ms. Rothamank. This is like you've taken the presentation from last year to a whole different level. I think, I think the pictures are extremely helpful when you talk about boiler replacement. I have no idea what that looks like. So that visual was very helpful. And even with the portable classrooms, you know, how that setup is going to happen. I think visually it was extremely helpful Good. Uh, for me. Good. Thank you. Thank really you good. for doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a one question in terms of, you know, for the high school, we are talking about a permanent structure, mm -hmm. right? And I can understand for Elmwood, we're ch choosing portable because we know that we don't know what's going to happen with Elmwood. Uh, with Hopkins, what is the rationale for choosing portable versus not a full build out? So I think as you, you'll probably see when we have this hearing on December 5th, as a for instance, as you re-envision, you know, when you're looking at a long-term vision, we're looking at all the buildings and what all the buildings could be. So if you were to re-envision Hopkins as a, as a for instance, if that was to become a 6-7 school as, as, you know, as, as one of the examples, you would probably put an addition on that would make sense for six, seven 
grade students and it may go out into where the playground is but where we're putting those portables is the fastest easiest way to get us classroom space for the students that exist right now but in terms of that long-term plan if we were to do an addition that might not be the spot you would probably be re-envisioning re the the cafeteria you if you're looking at six seven there are um, programming that probably doesn't exist in a four or five school that you would need to build for a six seven school and where would that be so putting an addition on would be like making that choice now we're not prepared for okay um, the second question is more related to costs, and I know we have talked about this a little bit in the past in terms of contracting in this space, it tends to be a certain way. So cost on two aspects. One, the Elmwood uh, feasibility study. I remember uh, when it came up perhaps two years ago, uh, we had made a projection for 600,000. We're at 700,000. I know in the big scheme of things, it doesn't seem like a lot, but still it's 100,000 more that and also comparing um, let's say the portable classrooms which are costing us two and three million dollars and a permanent uh, addition is costing us five million dollars can you share with the community uh, a little bit about you know why sometimes in this sector the costs are what they are so the 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 one thing that you want to do is make sure that you're putting an estimate on you know, based on what the engineer gives you as an estimate for that construction, for one thing. Um, but the other piece to always keep in mind is, uh, we'll take the high school edition as, as a for instance. If we were to move forward and get that design and engineering money in this current year, we would have a firm number on what that number would be in terms of the cost. So if you are accepting at town meeting to appropriate this as a borrowing and the cost came in at four million as a for instance, then you wouldn't borrow that full amount. So while you're appropriating a potential of five, you would only borrow what that actual cost would be. And because we haven't actually taken these two final bid, we don't have what that actual cost would be. But the nice thing to the taxpayer is when that actual cost comes in less, the town just would not borrow that money and it would not impact the taxes. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, yes it does. And um, I'm, I'm also wondering about the Elmwood feasibility study, why the increase in two years? I mean, the longer that you wait to do anything, um, costs go up. And, and again, when you actually take that out to bid, maybe that cost will come down. Okay. Um, and my other question is around uh, conversations with our town partners. Um, was there any conversation about, you know, when is it that we are coming off uh, with our debt on the high school construction and whatever those were, and are we ready to pick up some of these items, the readiness and appetite for this kind of borrowing? So we have discussed uh, what our capital you know, when I presented this to you the first time a couple weeks ago, also was given to the, the, our, the CFO and to the town manager. So they're well aware of what's out there that we're looking for. Um, I believe that the high school debt has rolled off. Okay. I don't have the debt schedules. That's something that, that the town has. Um, so. Oh, that's great to know. Yes. Thank you. Other questions? I have a quick one, and I, I don't want to put, I this is one of those specific questions that you probably know the answer to, but sorry if I'm putting you on the spot. Um, the roof, um, you mentioned that there's a couple different materials, and does, that doesn't seem to cause a problem, or does it cause a problem that there's a patch that's made of one material and a roof that's made of another material? That and the leaks, it is, is a problem. A problem. <laughs> so then my question is, or, that's kind of how what your face told me, but I wasn't sure if that was, okay, so, um, some of the roof will be repaired, some of the roof will be replaced. Mm -hmm. Are the numbers that we're looking at tonight for all the same material? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. so it will be done Consistent. properly. Okay, yes. okay. Um, and then uh, along those lines too, 
the solar panels, the roof under the solar panels are not part of the project. That is not part of the project. Are they, is that part of the roof though in good shape or is it because the solar panels are in the way? That part of the roof we do not have issues with at this time. So the solar panel, there were, they were um, having leak issues with that prior to me being here. Um, from what I understand, they, ha the they have been fixed. Um, so okay. we do not have active leaks over there at okay. this time. Thanks. Okay. Great. Other questions? I just have one in the Elmwood feasibility study. Um, I think the wording was that we would look at options, aside from the current condition, and what we don't look at options. Would that include options potentially on another piece of land? All right. So, in, in it, just kind of guessing at kind of the community looking at the all of this is it is a lot of money for some really important necessary things. And to keep in mind, I know um, my understanding is the high school comes off the debt service September one of twenty twenty, and Hopkins must be somewhere. Hopkins well. was built before, so yeah. So that's. Yeah. That, that would allow some of the borrowing to not impact mm -hmm. the tax in the same way as it would otherwise. Yeah, I would honestly re really rely on the, the town CFO to, to give those kind of details because he has the debt schedule. That's yep. not something that, that I have, yeah. you know, for the whole town, obviously. That's okay, that's great. Um, and I know you have a, a motion proposed here, Ms. Rothamick. Is it fair to say that we are looking to approve the 2021 capital plan? That's correct. Okay. So moved. Okay, so we have a motion. Second. A motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. yes. I'm a yes as well, so that passes. Thank you so much for all the hard work that has gone into this. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, so we will move on. Um, we'll continue the conversation here. Um, should we do item J? Does that sound OK to folks? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right. So item J is the capital plan special town meeting. Uh, Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes. So because on December 9th, the community is having a special town meeting, uh, we are looking at this as an opportunity to bring these capital projects, the uh, modular classrooms at Elmwood, Elmwood and Hopkins, and the six additional built out um, classrooms here at the high school to town meeting for um, town meeting approval. Um, so at this point, what would need to happen is Mrs. Rothermick and I would need to work on creating the articles to be put in the town meeting warrant. And essentially what we are looking for is what you see there in the for consideration. What we're hoping for is um, for the committee to authorize us to work um, with the town to get those articles on the warrant um, with approval from the school committee chair and um, to work with our legal counsel as well to make that happen. What did you say about the chair? Just want to be clear, am I getting into something? <laughs> <laughs> you would just be made aware of what the articles are that are going on the warrant in your role as the chair. Yeah. Okay. Plus that hours and hours of extra work. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, uh, so I just want to quickly ask this question. Um, you know, we were originally planning to put all of this uh, in front of the town in May, and I know that the special town meeting has given this opportunity. Can you please share why is it that we're choosing to present uh, our, which all articles? Are we presenting all articles, some of the articles, um, and why now rather than May? So, especially with the high school one, that one is the one that probably has the most um, urgency, I would say, because it's a construction project. If we can get the funding in place to be able to break ground in June, that would mean that we would be able to open these classrooms for student use um, probably before the second semester of next year. And just, you know, kind of given um, where we are in, in terms of enrollment, it just makes sense, we think, to get the project underway and, and get that done. And as Mrs. Rothermick said, the longer you wait around, the more expensive projects become. Um, and with uh, $500,000, we would be able to get the engineering design specs and the other 4500000 would go into the construction 
Um, so, so is it the high school one that we're talking about primarily? We would put all of them all three. on the line. All the building projects. All the building projects. That's correct. Okay. And so keep, keep in mind that the, the sooner you go out to bid for something like this, um, the, the better and more competitive bids you will receive for something that is going to happen this fast during the summer. Um, so the high school, the design and engineering for the high school project is extremely important because even that alone won't, is not a July, August build. Um, so the, the sooner you can get that out and to bid and lock down a contractor to um, build that, I would say uh, in, in speaking with Mr. Bishop, you know, to plan on having kids in there that second semester. Um, but uh, it's always the sooner you go out to bid, the, the faster you can lock down um, your, your vendors and the more stable you know that price is. Okay. So we're talking about $10 million, the $2 million portable, the $3 million portable for Hopkins, two for Elmberg, three for um, Hopkins, and five for the high school. Correct. Is that right? We're not asking for the feasibility study no. money at no. this point. Any other questions on this request, item J? No. No? Seeing none, um, I would like to seek a motion um, as outlined here and also that um, the school committee would be informed of the final items that would be sent out for consideration to the Board of Selectmen through this through the chair of the school committee. Correct. I move to authorize the superintendent to prepare articles for the town meeting. And all of those other things listed there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I, we may I, supposed to read that as exits. Do you yeah. mind read doing it right that? Here. I authorize the superintendent and business manager to prepare articles to address building needs as they pertain to enrollment growth for special town meeting warrant December 9th, 2019. Second. All right, motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. I'm an I as well, so that passes. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll go back. Um, you know, we are happy to continue to have our uh, members of public here. It's not common for us to have so many members. It's very excited. Um, <laughs> some of it's this not. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks. Should we go check their pulses? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so going back to um, old business item C, HHS final approval for Berlin, Budapest, et cetera. Dr. Kavanaugh. Yes, so two English teachers at the high school, Marie Martin and Samantha Breen, are looking for your approval to bring a group of uh, 20 students to um, Berlin, Prague, Krakow, Budapest, and the tentative but very firm kind of dates for that are April 18th to the 26th of 2020. Um, the dates might just shift very slightly because sometimes EF tours will, you know, book a flight or something that just takes them a couple of hours or a day off, so. Um, I move to it. approve the overseas trip. Okay, a motion by Meg. I'll second. Second by Jen, all those in favor? Yes. Uh, yes. I'm I as well, so that carries. Moving on to item D, HHS final approval for England, France, etc. Dr. Kavno. Okay, again, Hopkinson High School, Steve Spiegel's trip, um, but he will have additional chaperones for the 57 students. Among them are Mr. Bishop, Caitlin Burke, Mike Webb, Dan Collins, Andy Longoria, Kylie Murray, and Mike Willander. Uh, they will be going to England, France, Belgium, Germany, and leaving on the 17th of April, hopefully, and coming back on the 27th. And again, those requested dates can vary just a little bit. Yeah, do they need school committee chaperones at all? I know it sounds really <laughs> great, doesn't it? <laughs> we can make ourselves available. <laughs> I will let them know. Trip. Okay. <laughs> I move to approve this overseas trip. Great. I'll second it. Great motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. I'm a yes. yes as well, and so it carries. Um, next item on the agenda item E, HMS Club Advisory Stipend Change. Dr. Kavanaugh. 
Okay, this is a request that comes to you from Mr. Keller. Um, it really costs no money. He's just shifting a stipend, and what he would like to do is uh, get your approval for an Explorers Club for the 2019-20 school year, and that club will just replace the Debate Club, which is not running this year. Okay. I move to approve the new club. Great. I'll second that. All right. We'll keep this no simple. Questions. No questions? No. Makes okay, sense. Great. Um, motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Yes. Aye. yes as well. So that carries. Item F, Marathon School Paraprofessional Need. Dr. Kavno. Okay, that comes to you from Dr. Zaleski and uh, Lauren DeBeau, principal of the Marathon Elementary School. They're looking for an ABA paraprofessional, um, and they need this paraprofessional to service a student at Marathon, and um, it's really the result of a student move-in. Uh, the request totals $33,170 prorated for FY20, and it's going to be funded in FY20 through Dr. Zaleski's 240 grant. So. I move to approve the paraprofessional at Marathon. I'll second. All right. And no discussion? Anyone have any questions? Okay, great. Uh, motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye. I'm a yes as well, so that carries. Next item on the agenda, White House donations. Dr. Kavner. All right, and again, I know I say this each time we meet and we approve these donations, um, but I want to thank the community again for their extreme generosity. It's just been amazing. It has felt like a holiday as gifts just keep pouring in. It's been lovely. Uh, so in your agenda, you, you can see that you have Gerald Samrout for a vacuum cleaner, Julia O'Malley um, for some paring knives. Allison J, a toaster oven, Paul McNamara, noise canceling headphones, Allison Kaplan, food storage containers, Susanna Stella, food storage containers, Mrs. Bolello at Hopkins, a knife block, Sarah Navin, tied sticks and a pot holder, Peter Johnson, dish towels, oven mitts, pot holders, dustpan, broom stand, dustpan, uh, Amanda Robichaud, utensil organizer, Nancy Strack, a washer and dryer combination, and from Feature Marble and Granite in Uxbridge, Massachusetts, the donation of the granite countertops. And we had five mystery donations, a toaster, some noise canceling headphones, a box of donations, an all weather floor mat. And so even though they, the donor is unknown, we still need to approve all of those. So I am recommending that the school committee accept all of those donations listed. And I thank the community again. I move to accept all those donations. I second. Okay. Uh, all right, no discussion. No. Just, a thank you. Just a thank, thank you. you. Yeah. It's been an exciting thing to watch oh as this has all come together. Yeah. All right. Great. Um, so, all those in favor? Yes. 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 as well. So that carries. We already. Uh, okay. So on to item H: budget transfers. Ms. Rothmick. Thank you. Um, what you have are the budget mm. transfers. This is really kind of cleaning up how, um, from the very beginning, when we create the budget for staffing. And then this accounts for any personnel attrition, um, the, when they move a step in a lane, and um, anything, any staffing changes and shifting within. So this cleans up and lines up where the staff actually are and what the budgets should be in each of those line items. Excellent. Questions? None? I move to approve okay. the transfer of funds. All right. Motion by Meg, second by Jen. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. I may yes as well. Thank so you. it carries. Thank you, Ms. Rothmeck, for bringing that forward. Okay. Um, we already covered the capital items I and J, so it's on to item K, the school committee social media discussion. Um, yeah, I had brought this up during one of our conversations as part of the chair report, and I just wanted to, um, you know, start on this. Uh, journey of uh, exploring a little bit about having a web page for the school committee uh, within the purview of uh, uh, the school, the district sites and pages that we have. I know Amanda, you had asked some of this question. Um, my thought process was that we do something this year and then you know, based on how we are doing, we can figure out if there are other aspects that we could do. The whole premise of all of this is that uh, social media is here, and there are a lot of folks on it. 
Um, although it is not something that we are able to actively engage in and kind of have a dialogue uh, with folks, th my hope or my proposal for the committee is to at least be present there, have a presence, uh, and perhaps look at two aspects this year. One, um, to have the school committee meetings be uh, broadcast on mm -hmm. Facebook as one uh, aspect. The second would be to post at least the agendas and minutes. Just with something as simple as that, if we start off with that and just explore, um, you know, I know that I was, you know, that was the good part of being at the MAC conference. I was speaking with some of the other districts. What is it that they are doing on social media? And everybody was talking about social media challenges uh, and that how do you interact with people? You do hear a lot, you know. Um, so I think there's much to be done. I hope that we will bring forth some kind of a policy around engagement, uh, but I think there's time for that. But I think as a starting point, if we just have a page and we are able to telecast our meetings and, like I said, uh, post uh, the agenda and the meeting minutes. On sorry, a are you talking meeting. Facebook or we said web page? Do you mean Facebook page? Yes, Facebook okay. page. Sorry. Sounds good. Just to clarify. If that sounds okay, I'd like to explore that a little further. Yes. Sure. Great. Did you have any thoughts on that, Amanda? Um, no, I just, you know, with all the, the concerns of open meeting law and, you know, all the, there's a whole bunch of a rat's nest around public bodies on social media, but I think that it is important for us to at least broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, um, like, I like what Amy Ritterbush does with Planning Board and, and Facebook. She does a very nice job of putting out the same thing that Dr. Kavanaugh is now putting out through Georgia at the after our meetings, what our decisions are and our votes are. Um, and a lot of people get their news on mm -hmm. on Twitter and, and Facebook and Instagram. And I think, you know, it, it should be considered, I think, cautiously. But So when you talk about considering, do you, you mean jumping out and starting or having a discussion? No, or? but I want to bring that back and see what other districts are doing, what is the possibility, the OML. Yeah. But I just want to make sure that this seems like an okay plan that we take small steps, yeah. right? And this is, again, this is not an engagement, you know, this is not a dialogue. This is a, this is putting ourselves out there and making ourselves more accessible. Like you said, a lot of folks are getting their information through these platforms. And uh, just making sure that, you know, some of the conversations that we have, I think are so uh, great. And uh, it's great that we have the participation we do today, but that's not always the case. And to hear, you know, for instance, the CBT program that you brought forth, I would have loved for folks to listen in to all of that uh, mm -hmm. directly. Uh, because many times just the presentations, the meeting minutes are not enough. Um, and maybe people will catch a glimpse of it, right? Um, so that was the thought process behind it. And perhaps it requires some conversation with HCAM too. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have to figure all of that out. Right. I think one thing we might want to consider is whether or not you want to use your personal Facebook as the way to, to connect to this page or whether you want to establish your own school committee Facebook yeah. um, account. Uh, yeah. Just something to think about because I don't, personally, I wouldn't use my personal one. No, you know what I mean? I'm so totally I, with you. Yeah, I, yeah. I would start a whole brand new one. No, so no. I think, it, you know, yeah. just something to think about as, as you get this whole right. thing Right, absolutely. It yeah. would totally be under the school committee. Right. Um, uh, you know, account and just share, have this video. Again, it's an exploration. Sure, sure. That's you know, but just with a very small uh, approach goal for this year. And there are, um, as you know, I know there are requirements for data for retention for you know, right. um, which I know on our municipal side the infrastructure is a little bit different, and I know our municipal partners have been you know advised they're not prepared to handle all the retention right now. So, so for example, Hop Coalition, they don't want on social media because they can't meet the requirements. On the school side, we've been told that they can handle retention. We have plenty of school administrators who tweet and who are on Facebook and so forth, you know, with official accounts. So, um, but, but it, you know, there are a lot of things to consider. So we just want to go, go slow. Yeah. Is it slow enough? Yeah, I okay. think so. 
Uh, that's great. That's all, um, you know, was the conversation around it to proceed with that. And I hopefully will tap into each one of you for, dif for different things. I know, Nancy, you, you're fabulous with communication. Uh, you have that fine art, you know. Thank you. Uh, of being able to say what needs to be said and not say too much. Uh, so I, I love that. And I know, Amanda, you have done a lot of work in uh, finding out around the OML. So hopefully we'll figure something out together and we'll tap into you too. Are you looking at me? Yes, no. both of you. Uh, all right. So I guess we are on to our public comments for the evening since we don't have anything on old business. Does anyone want to make a comment? <laughs> no? No pressure. <laughs> we thought that's what you were waiting for. I know. For. <laughs> I was pretty sure this was the big moment. No. Uh, well, that thank you. Before we move on from public comment, just one quick question. Um, again, this, this goes back to, I wouldn't change my vote in a heartbeat, but um, if we were granted the money for the capital budget, or for the um, building, temporary classrooms, those kinds of things. Would those be ready to go for the fall, the temporary classrooms? The portable classrooms, Excuse me, yes. portable, portable yes. classrooms. So I I if we got this done now, when kids start in the fall, they we use those. absolutely need them. Right. So if yeah. right. that's what I was 12 thinking. 12 and 12 to 14 and 14, we have to have right. those spaces. Right. Yeah. Portable the classrooms actually are a quick <clears throat> install, and that typically does happen over a summer, and, and they're ready to go. And, Obviously, we would write the contract for substantial completion prior to school. So great. Yes. Okay. Great. Good. Thank you. Great question. Uh, moving on to future agenda items. Any thoughts, ideas? Um, I had a parent email me who was curious about what the goals were in the district for the development of the special education program over the next five years. Okay. So I thought maybe we could talk about that or because I know Dr. Zaleski's done a great deal of work over the past few years and it'd be wonderful to hear more about her vision and what changes, especially with this massive population growth, what's going to be changing with special ed. I think that's a great idea. Sounds like a plan, maybe something to figure out. I know some of these items take time to bring forth. Uh, maybe I should keep a check list of some of these items, not that we've had a ton. Um, the other, uh, I have one suggestion, and I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, every so often, uh, we hear about transportation-related concerns. Mm. Um, and, you know, with parents, I think it's, it's very hard when a, a miss happens, right? And obviously, from a district standpoint, I don't want to speak for any of you, you're transporting so many kids and you know sometimes stuff happens and uh, although you take every care for that not to happen. I was just wondering if there's any way we could bring back some data um, to showcase you know how many kids are we transporting? What does this look like? Um, you know something around transportation that helps folks understand the work involved to get some perspective um, and also see are there areas for improvement there? Uh, are there some things that we could done and could that ultimately guide some of our policy decisions? Um, that was another thing on my mind. Mm -hmm. does, it, does this make, make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm. So sometime in the future, hopefully. Okay. Um, anything else? Nancy, I, you I was, get, I was just going to piggyback on what Meg had said in terms of Dr. Zaleski. Um, I, I wonder if, and I haven't looked recently at what the budget calendar is, but if she would want to share any of that vision as part of her budget report or uh, her presentation, or if that maybe is asking too much too soon. I think she presents next week. Oh, so yeah, that that's okay. So that's yeah. not <laughs> right. Okay. Sometime in the upcoming yeah. uh, meetings, we have yeah, maybe after budget. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Um, moving on to the next item: items by consensus. All Dr. Right. Kevin. As superintendent, I recommend that the school committee vote to approve the items by consensus as outlined in your agenda. So moved. Motion by Nancy. Second. Second by Meg. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. I'm a yes as well. And so the motion carries. I'm seeking a motion for adjournment. I move to adjourn this meeting. <laughs> a motion by Meg. I will second that. 
second by Jen. All those in favor? Yes. yes. I'm a yes as well. And so we are adjourned. Um, very My early, Nancy. That's because we didn't jinx it by saying it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll take that. At 9.16 p.m., our next meeting um, of the school committee is on November 21st, 2019, right here at the high school at 7 p.m. Um, as you know, we are also planning for the public hearing on December 5th, 2019, right before our regular meeting at the high school auditorium. Thank you everyone who is here and also to those folks who are watching uh, at home and a special thanks to Bob from HCAM. Always. Thanks, Bob. <laughs>